Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, uh, today back to working on our metal planer restoration and today's task is going to be repair a broken casting. Uh, we broke this piece uh, while we were doing some testing on the machine a couple of weeks ago and I need to get it knocked out so that we can get this machine tested up and running uh, like it should. Uh, I'm gonna zoom you in here. I've showed this previously, but I wanna kinda show you guys what happened, why it happened, and uh, let's talk about our game plan on how we're gonna go ahead about fixing this. So this is the piece in question that we got to work on. And basically what this is, it goes on the metal planer and it is a lever that moves a um, piece back and forth that when it rotates on the machine, whenever a, a dog hits at a stop dog in two directions, it's going to flip flop back and forth and it's connected to some linkage that moves a belt shifter side to side in the machine that uh, makes it either go in forward or reverse depending on which set of flat belts uh, is uh, in, engaged. Now, here's what happened. Uh, when, when I first tried the machine out under power, uh, it cycled about twice and this thing just broke off. But what I think is important to look at here, if you look in here, you can see this dark staining. Uh, it's actually on both sides right here. And what that indicates to me is that this part had been cracked at some time a long time ago. And this staining that we're seeing in here is actually where some oil and grease and trash and whatever had gotten in there. So the piece was already cracked, it was already fractured. And evidently whenever I uh, started using it, it just went ahead and it, it gave up. And that's where we had all the, the fresh crack in there, fresh break is. So uh, while this was definitely disappointing to see at the same time, it's probably saving me some time down the road by going ahead and breaking now. I can go ahead and fix it now rather than this thing breaking in the middle of a job and causing potentially all kinds of problems. So, uh, uh, you know, don't want to have to fool with it, but thankful, I guess it happened when it did. So here's what my game plan. I mean, I could, uh, if I have to, I could, I could draw this part up, make patterns, get a new piece cast, machine it all out. But instead, uh, I think we're going to try to, to salvage this piece, this original piece, and keep it together. It's, it's in fairly good condition other than the, the break. Uh, we didn't like lose any chunks or anything like that. And uh, in my mind, this is a good candidate for brazing back together. Now, I talk about this a lot when I'm doing talking about repairing cast iron. Brazing is my preferred way of repairing cast iron. I know there's a lot of opinions out there on this. A lot of people will say, oh, you need to weld it with a nickel rod. You need to do this. You need to do that. Uh, there's a lot of people talk about TIG brazing versus flame brazing, so on and so on. Um, I'll just say that I have had a lot of good luck brazing cast iron. In fact, my success rate brazing cast iron, at least in recent years, is almost 100%. Uh, and I'm comfortable doing that. I'm not going to say the other ways can't be done, uh, but this is what has worked well for me. And, you know, I've got a process down. I'm, I'm sticking with it, guys. I'm not going to try to change up. So we're getting ready to start brazing this. I went over to my wire wheel, got everything cleaned up real good. I don't know how well you can see it, but I ground out a lot of this material. That just gives a place for the braze to flow into, to fill into, and kind of grab a hold of that cast iron and hang on to it. And I know that that doesn't look like a really something that would really hold really well, but this uh, bronze, it'll it'll really grab a hold of that. It'll really do a good job. Uh, it, a, a brazed repairing cast iron, a lot of times if it's done right and you go to try to break it, you'll actually break the cast iron before you break the braze joint. So it, it is a very strong repair if done properly. So I've tried to do my prep here. I've got it in a, a clamp clamping everything together. Uh, I've got some fire bricks up underneath this. Uh, the whole idea there is, is uh, I don't want it on the table where it's sucking the heat out of these parts. Once I get some heat in these, I want it to stay in here. So the fire brick is just some insulation between my table, which is a giant heat sink and the part. Now to braze this with, I'm going to be flame brazing. So I'm going to be using a brazing uh, torch here and uh, oxycellin type torch. Um, you know, uh, I always get asked about TIG brazing and, and I've done some TIG brazing. My personal preference is I prefer to TIG braze on smaller parts that don't take as much of a heat 
to keep, to get, keep the heat built up in them. When I get to larger parts, and yeah, I would consider this a larger part, I prefer the torch because I'm, I'm keeping the heat in the part itself. And when you're brazing, it's not like welding. You're, with welding, you're actually melting the base material. With brazing, I'm using a dissimilar material that will adhere. It'll chemically, mechanically bond itself to the cast iron, but I'm not actually melting the cast iron, which I think is extremely important in doing any cast iron repair. And one of the reasons why I don't like welding cast iron is because when you get the cast iron to a temperature where it melts and then it, it cools back down and hardens, you have the potential to create a very weak area right there in that area that has melted down. It can become extremely hard and brittle. And uh, again, that just gives another place for a fracture to occur. Cast iron can go through a lot of heat and cool back down. It's not like steel where it loses its temper and hardness so much uh, unless you've got a high carbon cast iron, but most cast iron is really not going to be that big of a deal. Uh, and uh, it's going to it's going to cool down just fine. So that's kind of my, my choice here for going with the flame brazing and brazing instead of uh, welding. So enough talk. Uh, my plan here is that we're going to get some heat in here, uh, get this kind of tacked together on both sides and then I'll start actually brazing it up and uh, basically filling in all these areas um, where I've ground out. So let's get it done. All right, we're going to start here by taking our torch and we're just going to slowly start introducing some heat to this and over a fairly wide area. I, when I'm doing a preheat, I try to get the don't just focus on one spot right there uh, and get it up to temperature because basically the, the metal is just going to suck that that heat right out. So I really want to at least get a, a preheat on all of this. Uh, if you have an oven in the shop, you know, putting it in the oven and getting it up several hundred degrees really helps. I don't have that, so uh, I'm just using the torch. So it's going to take a few minutes uh, to kind of get this up uh, to speed. I'm already seeing a little bit of a color change in there, which tells me that it's getting up a couple hundred degrees in some areas already. Um, but I'm not going to bore you to death. Like I said, we're just going to kind of heat this up. My goal is, is that when we, before we start brazing, I want it, the area that I'm brazing to be kind of a, uh, a, a red, kind of a, a, not a, super bright red. We don't want to melt the material, but we want to get it up to temperature and then that braze will just kind of flow right down in there. And when things are ideal and you're brazing, you're really not using the torch to melt the bronze. The bronze is, is melting just by coming in contact with the metal. Uh, we usually have to persuade it with the torch a little bit, but in principle, you really want the metal to be hot enough to melt the, the braze down into those holes. So we'll bring you back here in a minute when uh, we get up to temperature and we'll start our braze job. All right, we've been going after this for a while now. And um, when you're heating this, you can kind of see it starting to have a little dark cherry red to it. It's not quite up to temperature yet. And I'm still trying to focus the heat down in that larger area below it. It's, it's heating up top faster than it is down below because I got a thinner cross section. But uh, we're almost to temperature here to start the brazing. And again, right now I just want to kind of tack it, uh, get everything held in place. And I'm introducing my bronze and it's just flowing right down in there, which is exactly what I want it to do. Want to get down in those little crooks and crannies. I'm not putting the flame right on the area that I'm brazing. It's really just kind of conducting up from the material around it. I'm gonna come around here to the back side and try to get some heat down in here. Uh, again, just kind of very lightly applying some uh, braised material down in there. I want it to flow down into that, those cracks. I'm going to turn my torch off 
and I'm just going to flip this whole thing over. I got some material there to kind of hold it in place and we want to try to position this thing around the other side and do the same thing. I'm just going to leave it like that and we'll kind of work on this side coming down right here and then go to the other side. I got my part over here in the vise now, and I'm just trying to position it where I can get into this area and have the gravity working in my favor. So uh, I'm putting some heat back in here again, and we'll continue brazing this on out. I repositioned again, just trying to get gravity working in my favor. Hi guys, there it is, uh, for better or worse. We're just gonna let that uh, cool down real so I'm gonna wrap it up in a welding blanket and uh, we'll come back and clean it all up kind of after the fact. Right now you got a bunch of just junk in there that's, uh, probably making it look worse than it is. We'll do some grinding. We'll get these ends turned down to a uniform size so that we can put those rings on there. But um, I think this is gonna be just fine. I think it's gonna be just fine. So uh, let's uh, wrap it up. We'll let it cool down overnight and work on it tomorrow. So we have got this thing brazed up. It's cooled down overnight. It's actually the next day now. And I've got this over on the lathe. And um, what I want to do is go ahead and, and turn this outside area right here and get it where it's just cleaned up, whatever it turns out to be. Uh, I may not get it cleaned up on this brace side all the way, but I, ne I need to have a good surface that I can put a ring over this and shrink a ring on there to get it running uh, or to kind of help hold it together. So uh, we're going to get in here and kind of chisel away with that on the lathe. Uh, I have got this thing running as true as I can get it. I know I think there's some run out in it, but it's not going to matter. I just need a surface to put a ring on. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time trying to fiddle around with this thing with all this braze on here and get it running perfectly true. It's running, it's running pretty good right now, I think. Um, and to do my turning, I've just got a boring bar. This is actually a left-hand boring bar, so I can work on the front side. A regular boring bar I'd be working on this side over here. I've got it set up. I've got plenty of clearance here. I am going to have to be a little bit careful with this knob swinging around, make sure I don't get in the way of that because uh, that can be dangerous, but uh, it is what it is. Everything clears. I got the stick out on the boring bar. That's the reason I'm using a boring bar so I can kind of reach in here and stay out of the way of this uh, swinging death trap over here. So let's uh, start up the lathe. I do have the lathe running at a little bit lower RPM. It's a little nerve wracking coming in here with that uh, part flying around kind of in your face, but I do want to just kind of come in here and start kind of nibbling that bronze out in there in the back. And then we'll uh, start turning that whole piece down so that we can get a ring on it. I'm just going to take my time, work through this. Interrupted cut right now, but uh, we'll get there. Right now, I'm just kind of cleaning that surface up in the back. This braze is all the way down that arm, and I'm trying to get that cleaned out first, and then we'll worry about turning the uh, diameter there.
think we got it here. That ring will fit right down on there now. We got a little bit of area in there. I'll probably just, once I get that ring on there, we'll probably braise that area up just to make sure it all captures it good. But good job. We're gonna go ahead and get the other side set up and do it. All right, I got my part turned around now. And uh, basically we're gonna do the same thing on this side. Although I think I'm gonna choke my boring bar up a little bit closer. I don't need all that stick out uh, because the handle now is kind of swung back over behind the chuck which makes things a lot less nerve wracking. Still got to watch out for that thing coming around, but at least it's not like right there in your face. So we're just gonna kind of come in here a lot closer. That will really help us from the standpoint of uh, not having to worry about that, not having as much flex in the, uh, in the boring bar, particularly on that interrupted cut. Uh, anytime you got a boring bar, you got that stick out and that can really play havoc in certain circumstances. So uh, just make sure, swing this thing around, make sure I got clearance. I don't see any problems. We're not gonna have any problems there. So, all right, that looks good. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna kind of come into about right there and start by facing down the back and getting that cleaned up. So I'm gonna bring it in until it just barely touches. I'm starting to get a little tick right there. So that tells me I'm coming close to being in contact. And now I'm just gonna bring that cutter in and kind of clean that back face up. I'm gonna stop right there because there's a glob of braise kind of back right in here. And I need to kind of knock that down a little bit before we go too much farther in. So, uh, really close to getting into the cast iron. I think I'm gonna, yeah, we're cutting into it now. And it looks like I got this side running a little bit truer than I did the other one, which is good. Let's see where we're at. Yeah, that's actually cleaned up all the way around. I'm just gonna take a really light pass and get a nice finish on it. Maybe just about four or five thousandths. Now I wanna kind of face this uh, front. I got a little glob of braise on it. And I'm gonna get it all cut out. And I think that'll do it. Yeah, that looks good. All right, that looks a lot better. You can see there where the braise is. It looks like we got good penetration. I don't see anything kind of pulling out or flaking out. We got a piece we can shrink a uh, collar on there. And I think all will be good uh, once we get that done. So, all right, let's uh, make our collars. All right, we are ready to make our first uh, retainer ring that we're gonna put around there. This is gonna be the smaller one. And I just picked up a piece of scrap metal here. It already has a hole bored through it, so it's gonna make uh, boring it out a little bit easier and uh, I can get what I need out of that. So the outside diameter on this needs to be 
uh, which is really nothing critical on that. It uh, just needs to be close to that. The inside diameter, however, is a different uh, story. It needs to be point, or 1.876, and it needs to be right on the money because it's gonna be a press fit up underneath that uh, machine surface that we have on the other piece. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and rough out the outside here. Like I said, get a couple thou, we're good on the diameter there. Come here and touch off. We'll just do a little bit to clean it up and I'll get a good measurement to start working with. All right, we're getting down close. I'm just gonna dial in on the digital readout. 2.2, oh, right there. And like I said on this one, we just gotta be in the ballpark. I'm not even going to bother measuring it beforehand because it just doesn't matter. All right. And we'll look good there, about three, four thousandths over. I get a boring bar set up and we'll, uh, actually I want to face that front real quick before we take this cutter out. Okay. All right, let me get my boring bar set up. All right, boring bar set up. We'll come in here and we'll just start by making a run through there, get it cleaned up where we can get a good measurement. All right, I got down close. I'm within about 15, 20 thousandths of my final diameter. And what I did was I just stopped, I turned the machine off and walked away for a little while, took a break, and I let this part cool down. Uh, because this is a critical measurement, just the heat from turning this part can cause that measurement to grow. And then whenever you it cools back down, you'll be out of tolerance. So um, I wanted to get my rough, get everything kind of roughed out to shape uh, on that inside bore and uh, then come in here and take a good measure. But before I do, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna turn the lathe on. We're gonna let it recut that last cut uh, without moving anything. It just should take just a really light cut through there and uh, then get a good measurement on it. So let's fire up our uh, machine and roll down through there. So that little bit of uh, metal that's pulling out is a combination of any flex in that bar from the previous cut, but probably more so than that, because it had a good bit of heat in there, that inside diameter had grown, and as it cooled down, it shrunk back down to size, and this is gonna be a more accurate measurement uh, to what it will be once the part is cooling at, at, at the temperature that we're going for. So uh, anyway, we'll get a good measurement here and hopefully finish this thing up and hit our number right on the, on the, on the mark. And I'm gonna come in here with a bore micrometer. And we are really, really close. So um, I'm shooting for, what is it? Two inches, or excuse me, one inch, 186,000, well, actually 85,000. So I went back and remeasured over there. And we are at 185, 86, 87, 88. So I've only got about 2,000 that I need to pull out of here. So um, what I'm gonna do is come back in here and just run my cutter back through there blank again. I'm not gonna move anything uh, because there was, I, I noticed when I pulled out, I still had a little bit of a, uh, still a little bit of contact in there. So this uh, is still cutting just a little bit out. 
And let's take another measurement here. And look at there, we're right on the money where we want to be. Uh, I think that's going to work just fine. That should give us a nice uh, shrink fit on there. And that's going to give us about a half a thou of, uh, of uh, clearance, which is right where I want to be. So I think we're good. All right, so I need to measure my depth here of my parting tool. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a block here and put on there, and I'm just going to bump this up, and I'm going to zero my digital readout in the z-axis right there. And now I can just measure in however deep I want. This needs to be 450 thousandths. So two, three, 450 right there. I'll just lock that in on my digital readout or on my carriage, and that should give us the measurement we need to part it off. I'm gonna pull in my tailstock here. It's got a little piece of metal in there. I was just gonna catch that ring when it comes off. We'll just cut her right out of there. There it goes. All right, one ring down, and I'm going to turn the other one off camera. Same basic principle, just a little bit different dimensions, and uh, we'll go press those on. So I've got my two rings cut here, and uh, next step is that we want to actually press these in place. So this first one, just it, the top up here is kind of not the same diameter and it drops on there just a little bit but it won't quite go down which is good we want to shrink it in place so that it's good and tight so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this ring and i've got a fire brick over here and i'm just going to take a uh, little propane torch or map torch here we're going to heat it up and when it does it's going to actually expand that metal just enough Hopefully it'll just slip right up over there or press right on there with the arbor press. It might press on there right now, uh, but I'm gonna heat it up and shrink it in place and uh, that way we don't worry about getting it halfway on and getting it stuck. Uh, so uh, let me get some gloves on here and we'll put some heat in that part and hopefully press it right in place. My goal here is, again, I'm not trying to get it red hot. I'm just trying to get it hot enough that it expands a little bit. And uh, it won't take a whole lot, but uh, it's amazing how much steel will move uh, with just a little bit of heat. Even in normal weather conditions, the amount of expansion in steel, uh, particularly in larger parts, can be quite, uh, can be big numbers. It can add up to fairly big numbers. So. Uh, we're not looking for fairly big numbers. If I can get a couple of thousandths out of this, we will be golden. So um, I'm gonna heat it up just a little bit more. I'm starting to see a little bit of a color change there. It's kind of turning a straw color, which tells me that it's getting on up to heat a little bit. And we've got a fairly uniform straw color on it right now. I'm gonna use a pair of pliers here to pick it up, bring it over here. Look at there, it just, I didn't even have to press it. It just dropped right in place. And when that cools, it's gonna shrink and should just uh, hold right in place. That's exactly what we want. So um, it would not go on before. So this is a, a really good sign here. So we'll let that cool down and shrink in place and we'll flip it over and we'll do the other side. Yeah, it's already frozen on there. So you saw that it just dropped right on there and that is on there tight now. It's still warm. It's not even completely cooled down, but it's uh, already shrunk into place. So let's uh, get set up for our second one here. And same drill, we'll just, uh, this one again, it's not going down on there. We'll heat it up and see if it'll drop on. If not, we'll press it in place. And just like the other side, just uh, dropped right in place. I think we're good. So we'll let that one shrink in and uh, no press required. Well, there we go. We have a ring on both sides there. 
both of those rings were shrunk in place. And yeah, I'm sitting here debating on whether I want to keep this part back up and fill that back little area in there with braids just to make it look good or just leave well enough alone. Um, it's not going to be any stronger if I put any more metal in there. I've got plenty of holding power in these rings. I, I think I'm just going to leave them like they are and it'll be what it is. Um, one thing I do need to do is go ahead and re get these repainted uh, and ready to go back on there. But I really feel good about this repair. Uh, honestly, the braze job was probably sufficient, but because of the way it broke out right in that keyway, I just wanted some added assurance. But putting these, shrinking these rings on here like this, I mean, that should give me all the strength and stability that I think that I'll need uh, going down the road. I think everything will be good here. So anyway, I'm gonna slap some paint on this, let it dry overnight and we'll get it back on the machine. Uh, and I got my other belts in now, so I need to get the rest of my belts on there, get everything adjusted, and hopefully we can see this machine operating like it's supposed to be. So that's the game plan. Just did a test fit over here. It looks like everything's gonna work out fine. It's fit up on there, uh, so that's good. I had to do a little massaging on the inside of the shaft. I had a little bit of braze get down in there, but we were able to get it out, no big deal. Um, and a little bit of sanding and stuff in some of those places, but it's a good tight fit. I think it's gonna work out fine. Like I said, we're gonna go ahead and get this painted and uh, I'll get this back on here and hopefully we'll be ready to give this thing another try. So that's the game plan. So guys, that will be a wrap. As always, thanks for watching. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thumbs up and comments are appreciated as always. Hit that bell icon up there uh, to get notifications and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And with that, we'll catch you on the next video and hopefully the next uh, installment on the planer episode is going to see this table moving back and forth. Keep your fingers crossed. Uh, we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks.